Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. We are looking forward to an outstanding panel today. Um, the title for this panel is Charting a Course, What Can We Learn from the Oil and Gas Sector? I'm George Fibby. I'm a partner at Baker Botts. I'm a partner in the energy litigation and energy regulatory groups at the firm. Um, by way of background, I've been with the firm for a little over a year and before that served as the Deputy General Counsel for Litigation, Regulation and Enforcement for the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, and where I, I was involved with a wide variety of, of policy issues across a broad range of, of issues in the energy sector. And my current practice similarly uh, addresses, um, deals with issues in, both in oil and gas as well as renewables and the power sector. I'm delighted to be here and be able to moderate the, uh, this panel today. And I'd like to thank the Baker Institute once again uh, for collaborating with BakerBots to put on this outstanding conference once again this year. So let's jump right into our discussion. We have an outstanding panel uh, this afternoon. We have uh, four speakers, and I'll, I'll introduce them uh, individually before they speak, but we'll have Thad Hill, who's the president and CEO of Calpine, Bob McNally, the president and founder of Rapidan Group, Jana Goladriga, who uh, is the chief digital and administrative officer at Phillips 66, and Mark Finley, who's a fellow in energy and global oil with the Baker Institute. So we have, we have an outstanding uh, panel, and I know they have some interesting thoughts to share with us, and hopefully we'll have a lively discussion. Uh, also, I'd like to remind those joining us today that we do have a, a Q&A function. We will be spending a fair amount of time on questions from the audience. So please feel free to sub use the platform to submit your questions and we'll do the best we can to address them uh, as we go. We have an hour and a half for the panel. So hopefully that will give us the opportunity to, to address uh, most of the uh, material that comes in. So with that, let me introduce our first panelist, Thad Hill. Um, Thad is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Calpine. Um, he has been with Calpine since 2008, uh, serving as um, uh, originally, uh, he, he was, he, now he's the uh, President and Chief Executive Officer, but before that was the Chief Operating Officer, um, and before Calpine, Thad was with NRG Energy from 2006 to 2008, uh, served as president of NRG Texas from 2007 to 2008. Prior to NRG, he was executive vice president of strategy and business development at Texas Genco. That's from 2005 to 2006. And then from 1995 to 2005, Thad was with Boston Consulting Group. He was partner and managing director and led the North American energy practice there. I would be remiss if I did not mention that Thad received his BA from Vanderbilt University, um, magna cum laude, and an MBA from uh, the Amos Tuck School at Dartmouth. So with, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Thad to please um, uh, give us your thoughts as we open up the panel on what's next for oil and gas. Thanks, George, and I'm certainly happy uh, to be here today. Um, just by way of introduction, it is an oil mill. I'm at our, um, our company, Calpine Corporation, but we consume a lot of natural gas, and so we'll have some perspectives that hopefully will uh, will be useful. I'm um, in Calpine. Uh, just by way of introduction, we are the largest uh, power generator for natural gas in on the United States. We also have large retail businesses, and we operate in 24 states plus Ontario. So just a little bit of background there. Um, 2020 has been quite a year and uh, for all of us. And then, you know, to use a quick anecdote, um, late August at one of my staff meetings, it was where my direct reports and I were together. The agenda, um, as we kicked off the meeting, started with wildfires in California and then went to the recent blackouts in California, reliability issues. Third on the event were the two named storms in the Gulf that were kind of bearing down in Houston. And we did not get to the pandemic to number four on the list, 
which, uh, you know, tells you it's a, uh, uh, it's a pretty uh, tough environment you're operating in. Um, and there's been a lot of tactical and operational focus this year for sure, but the world is moving on um, in many ways. Uh, you know, as CEO, part of my job is being a capital allocator. Um, and when you're a capital allocator, it's real important to have a discussion between what are cyclical trends and what are secular trends. Um, and certainly the oil and gas sector, uh, you know, that's very important, understanding when there's a cyclical play but there are other things that are secular with uh, the best example probably being shale uh, oil and gas, um, which has you know, maybe one of the most fundamental secular shifts to impact the U.S. economy in a long, long time. Um, but I'm gonna wanna focus on another couple of uh, secular shifts. The first is gas as a global commodity. Um, and the second, I wanna talk about the energy transition. And I'll be brief in these. Um, you know, Everybody at this conference understands how gas is globalizing. Uh, and there's now 11 BCF a day of LNG export capacity out of the United States to connect the rest of the world. And I'm not going to dwell on any of the economics. People will certainly know them, even will know them better than I do. But I do, uh, you know, want to raise just a fascinating, uh, you know, implication. Uh, if you go back 10 years or 20 years and you talk to anybody that had to trade gas, um, and you know, in this example in Texas somewhere called the Houston Chip Channel. You could never ever trade or procure gas in Texas unless you actually understood exactly what was happening in Henry Hub. In today's world, you can no longer trade Henry Hub or under procure gas there unless you understand what's happening in Northwest Europe. Um, and and this has become a very real, very real dynamic. I would also say, um, uh, you know, in our New England power plants, it's impossible to build gas pipelines across the state of New York. We are now for for power plants in New England, procuring global LNG in order to have fuel that we need for the winter. Um, so, you know, it's just a fascinating point. We're a domestic power player, and all of a sudden now we are doing deals to buy gas around the globe and to trade gas around the globe. The world is definitely getting more complicated. Uh, to move on to the energy transition, uh, the secular trend, as I mentioned earlier, is clear that the, that the energy transition is coming and that the world is going to decarbonize. Many states, um, have policies out there, some form of, form of uh, low carbon policy, whether it's a version of the Green New Deal, whether it's uh, renewables target, whether it's uh, net carbon neutrality by date. In fact, uh, Vice President Biden has a proposed policy similar to that. What I will say is generally speaking, most of these policies are way out ahead of a detailed understanding of the economics and the physics. Uh, only in the last year has the academic work begun to catch up. And, and I just you know, want to address a couple points along this line, um, which I think will hopefully be useful fodder for discussion. Um, so I'm going to use an example to frame it up. Uh, I'm going to go to the state of California. We're the largest power generator in the state of California. And it is arguably the most um, uh, advanced decarbonized uh, society or, or economy. Um, so there's a, a, by force of law in California, carbon reduction goal of 40% by 2030 from today's level. Um, and they're obviously much higher aspirations as you get towards the mid-century. But let me just stick with 2030, 40% by 2030. Today in the state of California, only 10% of, uh, of all of the greenhouse gases emitted come from the in-state power generation sector. 40% is from transportation, 20% is from agriculture, and the rest from home heating and industrial use and the like. Um, but when you actually think about how do you get a 40% reduction, let's say you could actually cut that electric number in half. You're only an eighth of the way there. And you've got to go after transportation and other things in a very real way. We saw the governor of California with an executive order now about two weeks ago, where he actually said there will not be internal combustion engine vehicles, at least light duty vehicles sold after 2035 in the state. Um, and so there's a very real realization um, that, that, you know, this is, becoming a much more challenging thing to go to, to go attack. Look, I, for better or for worse, and maybe it's a career mistake, my sector is very subject to mandates. Um, as George knows from his time in Washington, you can, you know, it's easy to say, shut the coal plant or shut the gas plant and build the wind farm or build the solar farm. It is a lot harder to tell somebody that they have to sell their F-150 and buy a leaf. It's also very expensive. And a lot of the academic work that's been underway has pointed to some of these things. So let me tell you my three big takeaways 
to, to wrap up from all the academic work. And it's been done by uh, Secretary Moniz, uh, President Obama, Secretary of Energy as a think tank, has done a lot of this work. There are other consultants who have done a very good job. And they're really, I would say for me, three big takeaways if you look at the body of the work that's just beginning to come out now. Number one, um, we're gonna decarbonize the economy. As we decarbonize the economy, you're gonna electrify almost everything. In the distant future, there's opportunity, maybe for hydrogen, we can come back to that. But for now and for the next couple of decades, at least, it's heavy electrification. That means load growth. That means a lot for our business. Item number two is renewables are gonna to continue to penetrate in a very aggressive way. Yes, there was policy support for renewables through the tax credits. Yes, those tax credits may get extended or they may not, but I will tell you the renewables are gonna to continue to grow dramatically regardless of the policy around this. They are on an energy basis, um, very, very competitive with anything else anybody can generate. Number three, um, as this occurs, natural gas units are gonna run a lot less. Um, and uh, you know, it's not a bad thing. You can decarbonize if you burn less fossil fuels at some level. However, we need every single megawatt of capacity that's out there for reliability. What these studies have shown is that as you get into a nor'easter in New England, where you put two feet of snow on top of the solar panels, four-hour batteries don't do a lot of good. We have a dry hydro year in, in the West, and 5,000 megawatts of hydro is offline for a year. You can't get there with four-hour batteries. Um, and so the work has really led to the role of natural gas and natural gas uh, generation units in particular. Um, in my view, um, it's not, it's an enabler of decarbonization, not an inhibitor. Um, so, you know, kind of my summary of all this would be uh, government policymakers have shown sometimes they can't suspend the law of economics, but not even the government can suspend the law of physics. And these physics will, will take over and, and will play a, um, a really important role as we figure this out. So, um, you know, I'll, George, I'll stop there for my opening comments, but it's a fascinating time and a lot's going to change. Um, and, you know, we have to recognize it's coming at us. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Dad. Excellent comments and, and a lot there for us to think about and and for uh, the further discussion when we when we get to the free for all toward the after the opening comments. So I appreciate that. Well, um, hopefully I'll provide some fodder for the free for all, but I'll, I'll let it be. <laughs> <laughs> Next, let me introduce Bob McNally. Bob is the founder and president of Rapidan Energy Group, which is a Washington-based energy market policy and geopolitical consulting firm. Bob has over 29 years of, uh, government, of experience in government and in the private sector as an international energy consultant, a senior White House policy official, and a hedge fund strategist. Uh, Bob is the author of uh, an author of a book. I believe when he begins to speak, you may see the cover of that book in the background, Crude Volatility, the History and the Future of Boom-Bust Oil Prices. Uh, Bob has testified before Congress many times on energy markets and national security. Um, uh, from 2001 to 2003, he served as Special Assistant to the President on the National Economic Council and the Executive Office of the President. Yeah. Um, and then Senior Director for International Energy on the National Security Council. Um, Bob earned his undergraduate degree in political science and international relations from American University and a master's in economics and foreign policy from Johns Hopkins. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Bob, if you could give us your opening remarks. Thank you very much, George. And it's a delight to be with you all. I am only uh, sorry that I can't visit the state of Texas to do so. Um, I, uh, I miss Texas. I'm speaking to you from outside of Washington, D.C., near Frederick, Maryland, and uh, wish I could be there uh, in person. But I'm really happy to join this, uh, this group uh, and, uh, and contribute to the conversation. So I think I'll step back and, you know, ask the question, you know, what are the most important questions for anybody uh, risking capital, uh, putting money to work, uh, dealing with litigation in the energy space. Um, you know, whether it's gas or oil or even coal um, or renewables, upstream or downstream, 
uh, in my view, I'm more of an oil guy, so my most of my work is done is is is, is around the oil market. But in terms of policy and regulation and even geopolitics, it spans all that. So just stepping back, I'm asking myself, you know, let's try and at least identify the most important questions. We may not agree, but no one can predict the future. Uh, this year alone ought to show we ought to be humble about our ability to predict anything. And, uh, and certainly in energy, uh, the energy history is littered with uh, dead and wrong predictions. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun reading if you want to do it. And we will talk about that a little bit when we talk about these transition targets that are being um, uh, bandied about. But I want to step back and say, what are the two most important questions? I think there are two. Because there are two trends that have begun developing this century, so since the turn of the century, which I think are going to still be the most important foreseeable questions in the next decade, no matter where you are in energy. Number one, and this is the trend that developed earliest uh, in, as we turn the century, is the absence of an effective swing producer in the oil market. Hard to overstate how important that is for explaining the extremely unusual, not quite unprecedented, but you have to go back 100 years, the extremely unusual oil price volatility. As we know with oil, in to a large extent, so goes gas or at least traded LNG and, and the economics of everything else. And so that near quintupling of oil prices from 03 to 08, followed by a collapse in 2014, uh, the former without a war in the Persian Gulf, the latter without a recession, which are the usual causes of oil price spikes and price collapses. That tells us, that shows that something very important happened. It's called OPEC lost control of the market. The book that I'm shamelessly promoting uh, behind me here uh, is about the history of the oil market. It goes and looks at periods when we had an effective swing producer, and those include indirectly standard oil. It was through downstream uh, monopolization and integration with what we call midstream now, but pipelines and railroads back then. So Rockefeller was the first great stabilizer for oil prices in the oil industry. And then after a bout of wild boom bust prices from the end of World War, from World War I till the early 30s, the Texas Railroad Commission, which you all, many of you I'm sure know very well and spent many hours working with, uh, Texas Railroad Commission was the OPEC of the world effectively from the 30s to the 70s and did a very effective job. Matter of fact, Texas, other oil states and the Seven Sisters sort of collaborated. And when you talk about an effective swing producer, there's nobody who beat them in terms of keeping oil prices stable during very tumultuous times for oil supply and demand. And then OPEC, which is more familiar to us, takes over from Texas in the 70s, does an okay job, but basically lost control in 2008, in my view. Texas lost control in early 1970s, not with a bust and price collapse, um, but with a boom in demand and prices getting out of hand to the upside. OPEC the same way. So, so we went through this period where um, you know you had a collapse in upstream investment, like 50 percent, from like 2014 to 2016, from over 500 billion a year to about half that amount in 2016, and prices fell from $100 a barrel in the summer of 2014 to 60 in six months all because of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a tumultuous OPEC meeting where Saudi Arabia said we're not, we're not cutting under shale, and then went down another 20 to $26 a barrel to convince Putin, I gotta go and start cooperating with Russia, uh, Saudi Arabia, excuse me, and we gotta get some stability back. And we just saw in the second quarter of this year what happens when you have a combination of a demand shock, COVID, with that swing producer group, this new OPEC plus is now a 24 member group. It's not the OPEC 12, led by Saudi Arabia, now it's OPEC plus, 12 plus 12, 24, led by Russia and Saudi Arabia, they're the new game in town. Uh, they they uh, came into being like the Texas Railroad Commission did and like Rockefeller did because of a price bust. And industry said, we may compete with each other every single day, but we simply, we'll all, we're all gonna die if we allow this kind of price volatility to occur when the when imbalances, especially with surpluses, build up. So now Russia, we just saw in the second quarter decided to try and get out of OPEC plus prison. Turns out they don't like having to voluntarily cut production. They're not used to it. They don't like doing it. They don't particularly like the Saudis, but they had to do it to prevent a price collapse. Well, they tried to get away from it and we saw what happened. Brent below $20 a barrel and WTI famously going negative 40 on a close of the May contract. So 
Russia learned the lesson a second time. So Russia is now back with Saudi Arabia. And for the time being, all is good. Oil prices are glacially smooth, relative certainly to the second quarter at $40 a barrel. And I think it would be comforting for those of you who uh, may not really be trading WTI day to day, but are more interested in stability and certainty in the oil and energy markets, you ought to be praying every single day that OPEC plus continues this decade to stabilize the market effectively. Because without a swing producer, we will have the kind of sort of space mountain roller coaster ride that we just saw in the last 15 years uh, in, in, uh, in oil prices. And oil is the tail that wags a lot of other uh, dogs, as I said. So that's question number one. Will we have an effective swing producer? I'll give you my answer to these questions at the end real quick, but I want to pose the question first. Second question, and this really got going after the Paris Agreement 2015-2016. Is peak demand real? Are policymakers really willing to expend the money uh, and the will and, and the effort to drive what would, by historical circumstances, be lightning quick transformation in, in energy use? Considering that fossil energy is 80% of our energy growth, we're going up by almost 2 billion people in the coming decades. Uh, as far as we can tell, humans still like to travel, uh, they like uh, protein. Uh, they like to be comfortable uh, and all the other things they get from energy. So energy demand is going up. The question is whether it will be largely fossil fuel driven or not. Policymakers now uh, are saying, uh, certainly in Europe, uh, in China, so-so. Um, and we'll see, that'll be my final point in, in the election. You know, we have, the, 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 the cause of climate change it now constitutes an urgent planetary emergency akin to World War II that requires wartime mobilization, central planning on a scale not normally seen other than in wartime in Western economies, and a almost prioritization of decarbonization uh, in the next five to 10 years. And that has generated forecasts, and I would say consensus, that they will be successful, largely successful. Uh, if you look at the span of oil demand forecasts, and now a lot of these were made before COVID and they're starting to come out, the new ones, so we have to see, but just before COVID, uh, the forecasts from the IEA, the EIA, and OPEC and others were for oil demand growth to collapse this decade without a recession. And that was basically saying, we think policymakers are going to be successful at imposing the taxes, paying for the subsidies, or outright just mandating consumers do different stuff uh, on the one hand, or consumers are just going to basically flock to these new prime movers, to new vehicles. Uh, that um, that run on, on electricity and, and not on oil. So I would say there is baked in the consensus already before COVID, demand's going to decelerate uh, because this transition is real. Now, those are the two big questions, I think. I think they're both open questions. Um, I will just summarize by saying I think consensus expectations of policy-driven peak demand in oil are overstated. I agree with that. Transition's underway. Uh, but I think, uh, look, the only thing we know about the, the consensus in, in any oil forecast is that it's wrong. It's the only thing we know for sure. And so we have to ask ourselves, where is it wrong? Uh, and I think the last big misses in the last 15 years were on the supply side. Folks didn't see shale oil coming. Folks didn't see Saudi Arabia not being willing to cut in 2014. But I think the next big surprise in energy is going to be the transition is late, that the willingness of China to subsidize EV purchases, which is already collapsing, is not going to go up. China talks big. Uh, they, don't, they don't act as big. Europe is, is quite serious on decarbonization. So I would say they'll go the furthest. And perhaps we can talk about that in the Q&A. The United States, much will, be, much, much will be determined here in about a month. This is the most important election, I think, uh, uh, for energy ever in US history. But in my view, in my read of politics is officials are a lot better at announcing his heroic targets that will fall due when they are no longer in office and no longer have to pay the price, then they are at meeting them. And you can start with Richard Nixon's energy independence by 1980, made in 1973, and go right through President I loved working for, George W. Bush, uh, who I respect and admire, and I, I just can't be proud enough to have worked for him. But we, we said there'd be you know hydrogen cars in the showrooms by 2018. There are a few, but once again, 
uh, sometimes our ambition uh, exceeds uh, the kind of realistic appraisal of the physics that Thad mentioned and other things. And then finally, so I will say, we're gonna have stronger demand for oil. The transition is gonna be late. And OPEC plus, they're probably gonna succeed at keeping a floor under prices, albeit with episodes like the second quarter happening here to there. But they, they will fail ultimately, I think, the same way the Texas Railroad Commission ultimately abdicated and OPEC abdicated in 1972 and 2008. They are not investing enough in the upstream to cap upward prices. And so those are my two big questions, my preliminary answers. And I don't want to go on and on because I think we're going to have plenty of questions on it. But I will just say, no question in my view, uh, either way, we're going to get a sea change in U.S. energy policy. Uh, if President Trump wins, it's not just more of the same but more. It's, it's more of the same with a 6-3 conservative court that could go well beyond the sort of uh, – uh, roll back and freezing of some of the more democratic initiatives, but actually start to question, and we have some lawyers here, but I hope we get some good legal views, but Chevron deference, uh, the idea since the 80s that uh, uh, courts should defer to agencies when there's a, if, if, if their solution is reasonable, that could be uh, chipped away here, if not reversed. Even Mass versus EPA, which sort of opened the, the floodgates of greenhouse gas emissions regulation of the Clean Air Act, uh, that could be um, uh, narrowed, if not uh, reversed, in the court, as we're looking at it here coming forward, it's with 6-3, assuming no packing. If Joe Biden wins, uh, again, while he is stopping short of an outright ban on fracking uh, and is not nearly as strident an anti-fossil fuel as Bernie Sanders uh, or, was and his running mate, frankly, Senator Harris is, uh, he still, while in the center of his party, the whole party has moved far to the left. And there's nowhere clearer than that than Thad's uh, favorite fuel, or one of the favorites, is gas. And, and I think John Podesta, the, the former chief of staff to President Clinton, said it best. He said, you know, President Obama said, you know, I used to think that gas was uh, a, a bridge to a clean fuel future. Gas was okay. It's a less emitting, but fossil, fossil fuel is less emitting. I no longer think that. That bridge is over with. And indeed, gas is now the enemy. Again, the framework, this is a long way from the Obama-Biden administration where we talked in terms of decades, pragmatic, market-based incentives, bridge to a new fuel future, all of the above. That's archeology, span it's gone. Now it's wartime emergency, central planning, maybe stop short of outright abrupt disruptions like bans on fracking. However, uh, make no mistake, I think uh, a, a Biden administration, a Democratic Senate, is a sea change uh, in, in regulation, at which it all aimed really at increasing the cost of capital from, for business. And I'll finally conclude with this. I call it sort of a Tet Offensive. Those of you old enough to uh, study the Vietnamese War, the Tet Offensive, uh, although ultimately a failure um, uh, tactically, it shocked and surprised uh, the South and the U.S., mainly because the attacks came from areas we did not expect. It was the not only the number of attacks, but from different areas. And so with Biden uh, and Democratic Senate, I think you'll see the usual suspects, uh, methane regulation, they'll probably take a good whack this time at uh, taxes, we'll, we're, with the debt going up, uh, and especially if they get rid of the filibuster, they're probably gonna be a removal of some, if not producing of some of the tax incentives that the industry benefits from. But there will be new fronts, uh, financial regulations. Administration has enormous power through the SEC. Uh, to uh, require disclosure, stress testing, uh, and other things to, again, raise the cost of capital. Lawsuits, environmental justice, a whole new area where the industry will have to contend with. So hard to overstate the stakes for this election. So George, sorry I went on and on. I probably also, like Thad, stirred things up, and uh, I'll close there. Thank you very much, Bob. Appreciate your comments. Uh, again, a lot to talk about. We've already started to get some excellent questions. Uh, coming in. So let's move to our next panelist for her opening remarks. Um, I'd like to introduce Jana Golodriga, who's the Senior Vice President and Chief Digital uh, and Administrative Officer for Phillips 66. Uh, Ms. Golodriga uh, uh, has more than 30 years of experience within the oil and gas industry uh, in a variety of roles, um, uh, largely focused on uh, technology before joining Phillips 66 in April of 2017, she was the Chief Information Officer and Senior Vice President for Services with responsibilities for global supply chain facilities uh, and facilities for Hess Corporation. 
She held that role since 2012. Before that, she was the vice president and CIO at BHP Billiton uh, and the vice president of information technology at Telecheck International. Um, she has also been a manager of information systems at Baker Hughes and was with Marathon Oil as well. So uh, Ms. Goladriga graduated with a master's degree in mechanical engineering from Kiev Engineering and Construction Institute in the Ukraine and without any further uh, further commentary, I'll turn it over to Jana for her opening comments. Well, thank you very much and uh, hello everyone. And it's a privilege to, to be here today and also to, to um, join the panel of, of these distinguished colleagues. I'm actually looking forward to the conversations and, and uh, uh, I've been in the industry for such a long time, and the only thing that is certain is the uncertainty. That's what we've experienced through, you know, I've experienced through my career. But uh, I don't think any of us have experienced what we're experiencing now. And um, to the previous uh, speaker talking about that we couldn't predict anything or can't predict anything, we have been pretty, pretty bad about it. Uh, it will be interesting to, to have the conversation uh, a little bit further of what the future looks like. But I just want to pivot the conversation a little bit to more of what today looks like and, and, and what's in our hands, what's under our control, because we have so many um, different impacts that, that are coming our way. And um, I'll start out by saying that uh, Philip 66, so um, we have more than 140 years of, uh, of uh, heritage, and we want to be in this business for at least 140 more, if not longer. Uh, we operate uh, refineries. Uh, we operate about 21,000 miles of pipelines and terminals, and we have over 7,500 branded gas stations in the U.S. and about 1,600 abroad. So we're, we're pretty uh, big and pretty spread out. Uh, mostly with the U.S. presence, and uh, we make and transport the products of energy. So that's uh, that's what we do. Uh, and our vision is to um, pr provide energy and improve lives, and, and that's really important to us. But at times like this, when we have so much uncertainty, one thing that's really important, we believe, is what's, what, what lessons have we learned uh, through all the previous uncertainties and previous impacts? And how should we pivot as an organization when it comes to uh, not just our workforce, but also what does technology bring as far as innovation? We have seen incredible, incredible technological breakthroughs. And the, the last one with, that we have seen that was hugely impactful uh, for our business has been shale revolution and, and what the technology has, has uh, brought to that. But then uh, now we're talking about what's next and what would be the next uh, evolution. But before I move there, I just want to say there's a couple of other impacts that we have as an industry. Uh, one, we're all focused on sustainability. And sustainability is kind of being looked different, uh, from different perspectives. And, but for us at Philips 66, when we talk about operating excellence, uh, we talk about the environmental stewardship, uh, social responsibility, and financial performance, this is the way we summarize and say this is what sustainability means to us. Now, we all have been uh, dealing with the financial performance, every company in, in our industry that we have to return to our shareholders. And we've been doing a pretty good job, job at this as Philip 66 since the split in 2012. We've returned 26 billion to shareholders. Operating excellence. So again, I'm, I'm uh, speaking to, to uh, my peers in the industry and we know for us, uh, safety and uh, health and environment that is our license to operate. So we have to have reliable and environmentally responsible operation of our assets. And uh, that gives us, again, the license to, to, to operate. Uh, and we continue to, to, to improve and bring in technology and innovation, how we do it better. But the biggest driver that we have now coming our way is this whole environmental stewardship. And environmental stewardship that um, uh, from operating excellence that uh, leads to strong environmental performance. We're also bringing in a lot more technology now in helping us. So we talked about we cannot predict what's going to happen with the uh, issues that we're all experiencing, but with the influx of technology and the new asset that we have as an industry. So typically we have our biggest assets is our people, clearly. Then we have our physical assets. And I think there is one that's coming up strongly, and that's data. And what decisions can we make 
based on data and how we can improve our environmental performance because we can predict certain failures based on the on data. So that's a big shift for us as an industry. And then um, clearly, uh, I'm sure that uh, probably uh, participants have heard that we as Philip 66 are very serious about the, the environmental impact. And we recently announced our most ambitious project yet, and that's in California. Uh, and that's to convert our San Francisco refinery uh, through Rodeo, California, into the world's largest renewable fuels plant with 50,000 barrels per day of capacity. So for us um, as an energy company to say, we're no longer going to produce fuels from crude oil, but we will use cooking oil, we will use fats, we will use greases, we will use soybean oil. And uh, that is kind of our big entry into the uh, environmental stewardship and renewables. And we're doing a lot, of, a lot more work. Everyone is looking at solar and wind, and you have to make it commercially viable, and you have to ensure that the consumer behaviors are going to change. And I, my personal opinion, uh, we live in the country of um, uh, free, the land of the free. Uh, we can't even agree on masks, much less to say uh, you're going to be forced to drive this, or you're going to have to do so. There's a lot of... Um, challenges that we have coming our way uh, to ensure that that transition can happen and it will happen in a sustainable way. And then, and then again, then social responsibility that, that uh, we all know about all of the changes that are happening in the communities. We have to uh, make sure that we can help our communities. I will say as part of the, uh, when COVID hit us and, and one of the things we had to pivot quickly uh, as an organization, one of the things we had to do, or three things we had to do, one is to protect our employees uh, the other one is to protect our balance sheet. And the third one is to protect our communities. So the communities are changing. So we have to continue to focus to, to, to have the sustainable communities around us and then the sustainable workforce. So with all of that said, what do we have to do as an industry? And I uh, believe in change. I believe in transformation. I believe that, that uh, what will take us to the next level is this uh, continuous improvement and continuous transformative mindset. And that's where innovation comes along. So um, I have been with uh, Philip 66 for a little bit over three years, and we have been transforming our business. So we kicked that off about three years ago. And it's interesting, three years ago, we did not have a burning platform. None of us did. So we were doing really well. And when you kick off transformation, at the time when you don't have a burning platform, but you have a burning desire to change, it has been really helpful for us to do it But uh, at, that, at that time. And uh, the technology that enabled a lot of uh, transformative outcomes has been phenomenal. So I think going forward as an industry, we need to continue to focus on how technology in different shapes and forms can enable the transformation. Uh, this is a, a different world we're living in. Technology is moving fast. For example, digital technology is moving fast. But the technology that can, um, you know, in our case, ensure that we use innovative technologies for the battery technology, or how we use petroleum coke, or how we, what improvements do we make from that perspective? That takes a little bit longer, and we're going to continue to to improve that. So I guess my, uh, it's not even a question, it's um, more of a statement that we as an industry have to transform. We have to transform our workforce. The old ways of the operating models are uh, uh, not going to work. We're gonna have to uh, change our operating model and more importantly, we're gonna have to change our ways of working. We're gonna have to trust the data more to help us make the decisions. And we have to get in the position where we can be a lot more predictive. Uh, and uh, that's kind of changing us as an industry from traditionally we were very uh, descriptive. We would describe uh, an issue or a challenge. And uh, we, when we went to being a little bit more predictive, eventually we're going to be more prescriptive. And that will prevent, prevent the, the um, safety incidents, prevent the failures. But also, it will bring us into the 21st century with the uh, workforce that's coming our way because we have a big transition, uh, generational transition, and that's really important to keep in mind as well. So, a lot of things, lots of things that I think I've covered. I did not want to repeat what my previous um, panelists uh, said, 
So I do want to focus on what's in the next three to five years for us. And I think it's a big transformation in the workforce driven by digital technologies and other technologies. And uh, another shift that happens, we were typically uh, very, um, we were kind of in our own bubble looking at uh, our peers uh, to 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 look at what's possible and what's the art of the possible. I think we're opening up a little bit more and looking outside at different industries, working with startups, bringing in different thought process to see how we can transform. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jana. I look forward to um, following up in the question session on, on some of your points, but I think they're very well taken and, and appreciate your, your joining the panel. Um, next, let me uh, briefly introduce Mark Finley, uh, our batting cleanup for us on this panel. Uh, Mark is a fellow in energy and global oil at the Baker Institute for Public Policy. Um, Mark has more than 30 years of private and public sector experience as an energy economist. Uh, before joining the Baker Institute as a fellow, he was a senior U.S. economist for BP. He led the company's um, short and long-term oil market analysis, uh, including the BP Energy Outlook, which I, I know many folks joining today are very familiar with. Um, for a dozen years before that, he led the preparation of um, BP's statistical review of world energy. Um, and before BP, Mark was an energy security specialist with the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, Mark is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of the University of Michigan and has graduate degrees from Northwestern and the George Washington University. Uh, Mark, I'm sure you have uh, uh, lots of, of thoughts to share with us at this point, so I'll, I'll go ahead and turn it over for your opening comments, and then we can jump into questions after that. Great, thank you very much, George. And let me add my thanks uh, to you and the team at Baker Bots for joining us at the Baker Institute uh, and organizing you know, this, this great annual uh, conference. And, uh, you know, betting cleanup, I feel like I'm actually, uh, you know, behind three Hall of Famers. And so, you know, the pressure's kind of on here. Um, I want to address three topics in my introductory uh, remarks uh, today, and I'll try to make them brief so that we have lots of time to get to the questions that are already coming in. Um, all of these neatly fall into the topic of, you know, you know, the, of our segment here on, you know, what's, uh, what's next, what's coming up for the oil and gas sector. First two are transition related and touch on topics that, you know, uh, the other panelists have already addressed, but uh, the last one I'm not sure is on people's minds yet, even though I think it should be. Um, for, for today's audience, I'm going to try to pull the lens back and aim to be um, a more strategic in, in the perspectives and comments. But I'm happy to talk during the discussion about what's going on in the markets today with uh, you know, the COVID impact on energy demand and oil, what's happening in the U.S. shale sector, uh, dynamics in the OPEC plus um, you know, on the policy front, you know, things that, that you know, Bob and others have already touched on, but you know, that I've written extensively on you know, here at the Institute. So first topic. The growing importance of ESG for the oil and, and gas sector, and we've heard about some of this already from, from uh, you know, I think each of the speakers. As everybody who's joining us today knows, the industry is under tremendous pressure from investors. You know, the sector's share of the U.S. stock market is at an all-time low, and it's not only about our history of return; it's about future expectations. And as the numbers show, you know, it's 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 a reality in the investing marketplace. Uh, you know, and perceptions and realities run hand in hand, you know, in the investing world. Um, and it's not just from, you know, the investment community. Many of you are hearing it from your lenders as well. Banks are increasingly cautious. And again, it's not just about returns. Banks are hearing it from their regulators as well. Central banks here in the United States, by the way, as well as around the world, you know, are increasingly focusing on the risks of climate change and an energy transition for the financial sector. And finally, you know, as Jana can attest, and again, many of you see in your own businesses, I think employees are a big part of this, both in recruiting and in retention. You know, they want to be part of the solution. So topic number one. Next up is energy security. How's that for a smooth transition? Um, here, actually, I think the oil sector is actually way ahead of the game. And by that, what I mean is that oil has been a strategic focus for more than a century. 
going all the way back to Winston Churchill. Doesn't everything in world history seem to pass through Winston Churchill at some point? Um, when he was first Lord of the Admiralty before World War I, he was worried about switching his Navy from homegrown coal to imported oil. And he decided that the better performance of ships powered by oil was worth the risk, which he would manage by diversifying sources of supply. You know, a century later, we actually have a very robust global architecture to manage the risks of oil security. Member countries of the International Energy Agency, including the United States, have treaty obligations to share supplies in a crisis and to coordinate emergency plans for conserving energy, switching between forms, uh, different forms of energy, et cetera. Here in the United States and other main oil consumers also hold large strategic stockpiles to be help offset supply shocks. Uh, the United States also maintains one of its global fleets, fifth fleet in the Persian Gulf to safeguard supplies flowing through the strategically important Strait of Hormuz. And by the way, uniquely in modern history, at least, we also have in the oil uh, security realm, a commitment by a sovereign player, Saudi Arabia, to maintain a buffer of spare production capacity to be used only in the case of emergencies. Well, now let's turn that framework and think about the energy transition. And the answer is, <laughs> it ain't there. There's no such infrastructure for any other energy form, nor for critical mineral inputs needed for the transition. Think about cobalt for EV, you know, electric vehicle batteries, or rare earth minerals. So let's go through our checklist. Do IEA member countries have treaty obligations to share supplies other than oil? Nope. Are there coordinated emergency plans for cons conservation and switching between fuels? Nope. Do key producers maintain spare production capacity? Nope. Do we even have the basic data to tell us what's going on? You know, I can go to the Energy Department's website and download a time series on oil supply disruptions, their length, their you know their their magnitude, their duration. You know, Bob has literally written the book on the subject. Now, can I get that for data for natural gas or electricity or strategic minerals? Nope. Um, Ken Medlock of the Baker Institute and I are part of a team that just published an issue brief yesterday for the Group of 20 Nations, advising those governments to kick off an effort to build data needed to inform our decision making regarding energy security and the energy transition. You all know from your own businesses that you need to measure something before you can manage it. And our proposition is that policymakers can advance the energy transition by better understanding the risks and taking measures to manage and mitigate them. The US State Department's recent um, launch of an energy resource governance initiative is a great example of this process kicking off. Informed by the way, in part by great work from our colleague at the Baker Institute, Michelle Foss. And finally, my final point, and I know this is the one you're waiting for because it's the one I said you haven't been paying attention to. The question I get asked most frequently when I do interviews um, these days is, what about the future business model for the IOCs, the international oil companies? Um, and it's always in the questioner's mind about the O, about the peak demand concept that Bob already discussed. My answer is that I'm increasingly worried about the I and the C. You know, and this is something, by the way, that I would apply to the whole corporate sector, not just the oil and gas industry. For the I, I'm worried about the backlash against globalization that we've seen building for several years and that appears to be, if anything, accelerated by the pandemic. We're already seeing countries around the world pulling in, a uh, growing focus on domestic supply chains, for example. You know, if economists around the world agree on one thing, and I'll admit that that's potentially a big if, <laughs> because you can't get economists to agree on anything. Um, if we agree on anything, it is on the benefits, on net to the system as a whole, of trade and comparative advantage. But I think that we, and by the way, when I say we, I mean all of us, not just us pointy-headed nerds, economists, have gotten to the point of taking it so much for granted that we've neglected to continue making the case for the benefits of the system. You know, and working to make sure you know that those benefits um, you know uh, include the people who get harmed by these changes as they're taking place. Uh, well, how's that for putting the dismal back in dismal science? But it doesn't have to be that way. It just means that we need to get back to work to make the case for our post-war rules-based system of democratic free enterprise.
For those of you who just listened to Secretary Baker, heard him talk exactly about this, the need for America to engage and to lead. So I'd say, let's get to it. You know, let's not take that for granted uh, and try to work harder to make the case for a system that we all think actually does work pretty well. George, with that, let me turn it back to you. I uh, hope that's a useful addition to the panel, and I look forward to a lively conversation. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mark, and thank you to all of our panelists so far. We're getting a lot of outstanding questions, so uh, I'll just jump in and start pitching them out uh, to, to the panel, and whoever would like, I'll either um, suggest who might want to start, but, but feel free, of course, to jump in uh, for, for anyone. Um, the, the first one I'll, I'll start with is, I think you've all kind of identified some trends, and I, I like the paradigm that, that Thad set up at the outset of, of really focusing on identifying what, what are the secular trends, what are the things that are going to be enduring with all the change that we're seeing right now in the oil and gas industry? What are the aspects of that, that that are going to result in enduring change and what are the things that are that are merely cyclical so i think it's a it's an interesting way to look at it and and if that offers his views on what are the the secular trends um but let, let me ask if any of the other panelists have any thoughts along those lines what what is it that we're we're seeing today that is, is probably cyclical and probably is going to go away versus um, uh, versus what are the trends that, that are going to be with us for quite some time in this sector. So uh, with that, I, I don't know, um, uh, perhaps Mark or Bob, if you'd like to jump on that one. Uh, this is Bob. I'll happy to happy to give some thoughts. So thinking more in my bailiwick of oil, I would say a secular trend that has emerged in the last 15 years that, as I said in my opening remarks, I think will continue um, in the coming years to decades is the absence of an effective sort of permanent swing producer. We will have times like we do now, usually after a horrific bust in prices, where swing producers will come back and cooperate. But again, I, I wish them the best. And as a citizen of the planet, uh, I, I hope uh, they are successful. But I, I don't think they will be. And I think the challenge will come when, we, when the oil market uh, tightens up later this decade. And there is insufficient upstream capacity. The spare capacity that Mark mentioned vanishes like it did in 2006 and 2007, 2008. And, and demand is much stronger than we think. So that is a st structural feature. We are no longer on It's a Small World. The Disney, if we want to think about Disney World rides, it's no longer the gentle sort of 1930s to 1940s where oil prices, you could assume an anchor price out of the future, a dollar a barrel, what have you, and assume there was a central banker, Texas Railroad Commission, whose job it was to, to fix that price. And then we all could invest and trade around that. I think those days are over. We're on Space Mountain now. Uh, with regard to um, looking at the various components of oil demand, uh, we certainly, with COVID, have a cyclical collapse in, uh, well, everything, but certainly jet fuel and uh, gasoline and distillate, uh, sort of the three kind of main, main products. Uh, and then there's, of course, heavy fuel oil. I do think the displacement, starting with heavy fuel oil, that's a structural change and that's environmentally driven. I think that's likely to continue. IMO, uh, they will continue to, the countries, I think, sort of require uh, probably cleaner diesel, low sulfur diesel in marine bunkers, and there'll probably be less tolerance for scrubbed heavy fuel oil. Uh, with jet fuel, I think it comes back, but perhaps not for a while to the level it was at. Maybe domestic flights, intra-regional flights resume when we get a vaccine, but the pace of long-haul flights, I'll be a little surprised. And so I can see a shift of that jet fuel, which is all kind of the same stuff to, to, um, uh, to the marine bunkers. Um, I do think distillate, so heating oil, but uh, tractor fuel will come back with economic activity, but that will require a vaccine and or learning to live with this thing after we have herd immunity. Uh, the issue is gasoline. I think gasoline is one of the most fascinating products out there. Big bets on that. I think the consensus is it's down and out, and uh, it went down and out sooner because of COVID. Um, again, I think gasoline is going to surprise us to the upside, and I think we're going to be surprised at the strength both in the OECD and the non-OECD 
medium to long term for gasoline demand. Again, as sort of the flip side of my skepticism about the rates of penetration of EVs this decade that are built into for, uh, consensus forecast. Thanks, Bob. Jean, I think you have uh, some comments as well. Yeah, and I'm just going to try and make it really short, but uh, I believe that the climate change and energy transition is going to be enduring. So that that pressure and, you know, pressure on all of us. And by the way, I'm a big believer in um, our industry. I love our industry for many different reasons, because we have done amazing things for the humanity and continue to do. But uh, I do believe that these this pressures are going to be enduring. And if anyone can solve the problem on the energy transition, it's our industry. We know it better than anyone else. Uh, we have done some amazing things and we'll continue to do that. But the one that is, uh, is cyclical, and I absolutely truly believe in that, it's uh, the whole um, notion of remote working and how remote working is going to continue way past um, uh, COVID-19. And, and way past the, the pandemic. I just believe that um, from the social perspective, from the, if I look at the organization, what does it mean for the organization? Um, you know, I am a change agent, I like change, and, and it's really hard to introduce change when you're working remotely, but the most important thing that, that, that I think this is going to impact, if this is going to be prolonged, is the innovation. I mean, you really innovate when people feed off each other, and it's really hard to do it, when you're remote, and and I think it uh, it will impact cultures of the companies. It will impact the, their ability to 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 lead, and so I I think and I hope that this is absolutely cyclical and it's going to change. Mark. Yeah, I I would. Uh... Um, I think, uh, you know, uh, I would start by observing that, you know, one thing that I think that it will prove to be cyclical is the economic downturn that we're in right now. You know, even if the world's, um, it, it, there's good reason to believe that the world's economy may grow less rapidly than we're used to going forward, but it is going to grow. The world's population is growing, um, you know, productivity is growing, and, you know, that's, exactly how you get to economic growth. Um, and that means more energy demand. You know, there's a very strong correlation between quality of human life and access to energy, especially in lower and middle income societies. Um, and so I think that, you know, this there, I agree with Jana that, the, you know, the reality of climate change and the need to do something about it is a secular trend. Uh, but I think we will also see enduring tensions between you know, that prerogative and the need to for, you know, the legitimate need of people to continue to improve their quality of life through access to energy. Yeah, I think that's one of the key challenges that's going to be an enduring tension uh, in our uh, industry and for the world as a whole. Um, another thing that I think is an enduring structural uh, d dimension of this is that the game goes to the places that can drive the best innovation. And you know what does history tell us about that? You know, now innovation comes from societies that uh, provide the freedom and flexibility for people to experiment. And so, you know, I personally suspect that you know at least a big part of the answer to dealing with the challenge of climate change um, is going to come from you know some innovation that people don't necessarily have on their uh, radar scopes just yet including, you know, I mean, if, as an example of how these innovations can surprise us, look no further than the shale innovation, you know, in, in our own sector, um, you know, which I can assure you 20 years ago wasn't in many people's forecasts, uh, you know, going forward. Um, and so the question, I think, you know, and the, and the opportunity uh, is how do we unleash our single most potent weapon in this challenge, which is human creativity, you know, and what kind of systems can we put in place, you know, as policymakers and decision makers uh, to, um, you know, provide the right conditions for that to take place. Thanks, Mark. Let me direct the next uh, question to you, Thad, uh, based on some of your comments, and this is one that came in uh, from the audience. You. You've mentioned just the role of uh, natural gas in decarbonization. Um, there's there's a, a fair amount of tension at this point, and I think um, uh, Bob alluded to it as well. 
from natural gas as sort of a bridge fuel to, to uh, more pressure now, uh, particularly in places like California, to uh, reduce the use even of natural gas. And so I'd like to get you to comment, if you would, on this tension between your, uh, your, your position of the, the importance of natural gas in decarbonization and, and the tension that exists with, uh, with pressures to reduce even the use of natural gas. Is that something, a tension that's just gonna stay there uh, for years to come or, or is there a way that that gets resolved over time or, or uh, uh, settles out in the industry? So, so particularly in places where natural gas uh, may be very much needed to, to achieve some of the uh, lower carbon goals that are out there and being set by policymakers. Yeah, thanks, George. Well, uh, there is tension there. Um, uh, I think Bob used the term gas as the enemy. Um, and, and you know, part of our job and our advocacy is to try and untie that Gordonian knot. And, and here is where we may not be aligned as a company with a lot of other energy companies, which is I actually do believe um, it's okay for us to consume most natural gas over time. I actually think it will be a key part of achieving climate goals. Don't get me wrong, there's a lot of coal left in this country and displacing coal provides wonderful um, you know, environmental benefits to the degree uh, at whatever speed it happens, you can displace um, you know, burning fossil fuels and internal combustion engines. It may very well yield some economic benefits. Um, but at a certain point, if you're going to achieve deep decarbonization, you're gonna most natural gas. The trick, and what I try to make in my points, is you still need all of the capacity there because there are gonna be times, no matter how many wind farms you have or how many solar panels you have or how many batteries you have, when you're gonna need the fossil fuels to protect reliability. And my examples were, you know, the Nor'easter in New England or a cold, dark winter in Texas. And so, you know, it is gonna be critically important that infrastructure be preserved um, for when it's needed. So, you know, to say another way, our policy in a place like California or what we're pushing is to decouple us from the outcome. If it's the state's push to decarbonize, um, you know, we're gonna be supportive. We just, we're, we become critical infrastructure and our assets need to be protected and be a part of that solution because they're gonna be needed for decades even. Um, and, and just uh, before on the prior question, just to make a quick comment. Um, uh, Mark raised, uh, you know, raised innovation. Um, and this gets to the decarbonization of the energy transition. And the Secretary Baker just spoke, I think it's particularly apt to mention this. Um, we think the best way to get there is through markets. Uh, markets will, of course, help manage the pace of this to what makes the most sense. It will also get governments out of picking winners and losers and let the capital, let smart capital compete toward to deploy. And we think if you're gonna do that, an economy-wide cost of carbon is by far the smartest way. And then it will be what it's gonna be. And I know Secretary Baker um, has been, uh, uh, you know, obviously has proposed a plan, um, and we're very active on this as well, that we think economy-wide cost of carbon and rather than all the terrible central planning scenarios that got raised um, by Bob and Mark, I believe, you clear out the way and, and let the capital compete. So I hope if we are gonna proceed with this transition, um, it's under that kind of framework. Amen. <laughs> we, we, have, we have violent agreement on, with, with some other <laughs> panel members. Uh, <laughs> thank you. L let me shift gears slightly uh, for the next question. Um, and I'll direct this, Jana, if you'd like to take the first shot at it. Um, looking ahead in the oil and gas industry, if if you were advising, uh, say, a student at Rice University who's who's considering a career path and, and what does the future look like in oil and gas, I'd be interested in your thoughts first and, and the rest of the panelists as well. What, what do you see as the opportunities? I know you spoke a bit about uh, the importance of changing culture and, and how that's evolving in the industry. I'd be interested in your thoughts on um, what advice would you give a, a young, um, someone early in their career in the oil and gas business or, um, uh, or, or even a student looking to the industry for, for what the future holds? What, what, uh, what kind of advice might you give that person? 
Yeah, so I think that's a great question, and, and uh, it's uh, uh, one of the key things that's driving our transformation is to ensure that the future generation will be attracted to, to our industry for many different reasons. And I, I will say what, uh, um, and we talked a little bit about innovation, I'll continue to talk, to talk about innovation. And we are unleashing this, this uh, innovative mindset in, in our organization, and I feel that this whole transformation uh, allowed us to do it, and I'll tell you why. Because I've been in the in industry for over 30 years. I'm sure my my uh, peers on the panel have, know everything about this industry. We are so risk averse uh, historically, so that part of the culture is driven by our you know desire to be absolutely you know safe and environmentally and from health perspective and all of that. So that's is that's a given. But we have used that that risk mindset across broader impact in the in the company or in the organization. And once you open up the, the art of the possible and that you can actually fail in certain situations, as long as it doesn't impact safety or it doesn't impact the external kind of financial reporting, you can you can use that mindset so you can innovate, you can prove you use proof of concept and and, and you can uh, you can truly transform. So for us, when we were looking at this Advantage 66, as we call our transformation, it's um, it's helping us to become a more agile business, a more efficient business, and smart business. And that's where the data comes in. And and data is a big asset. And I know you all read that uh, it was a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, I think publications that talked about data is the next oil. And if you look at uh, different companies, look at Google, look at Amazon, I venture to say they're, they're data companies. That's what they do. They have, that's their biggest asset. So for us, when you talk about the future generation and what can they uh, focus on, what can they consider? Number one, we're always going to be an engineering uh, company. We have, we're a company of engineers and, and engineers are the most fascinating people, not because I have a degree in engineering, but because um, we're, we build things, we, we design, we, we innovate. But on the other hand, now if you bring in the combination of understanding engineering, and then you bring that, that computer science or computer engineering, and more than anything, data science, you combine the two and that's magic. Because I believe that the old ways when you were talking about, well, you have to have a um, uh, information management degree or uh, you have to have the, the IT type degree. I think in our industry, having a combination of you understand the business, you understand the industry, uh, you have the skill in, in engineering and you combine with, with the understanding of the data and what the data science can do, which is a future career, I think is fantastic future career for us. Computer engineering, cloud engineering, uh, engineering as we know, mechanical, chemical, and, and all the other ones, traditional engineering. But in combination with, with uh, uh, computer science, very powerful, very powerful for future roles. Mm -hmm. I'd like to second Jana's uh, you know, focus on, on data. Um, and, and in fact, I could uh, uh, bring that back out and, and say that in, um, you know, in, in the various business groups that I'm involved with, uh, some, many of which go well beyond the energy sector, Data is everything right now, um, and it's a fungible skill. You know, you can you know, apply big data to managing a baseball team uh, or an oil and gas company, <laughs> and so uh, it's it it and it is the way of the future with sensors and data gathering on everything. Um, beyond that, my only advice you know that I give to to the students and and recent grads with whom I've I've you know regularly meet is follow something you have a passion for, you know and you know what 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 got me into the energy sector uh and what's kept me here for 35 years is it is so cool you know and and you know yes it's data and yes it's marketable but man you know i would get to i get to one day i think about um you know the spread of COVID and what it means for you know travel the next day i think about um you know royal family politics uh the next day i think about batteries the next day i think about elections and you know the economic cycle and it's just no matter what you're interested in, energy is is involved, um, you know, and it's seen as a critical input. And so for me, that's what's kept me coming to work for 35 years. And, and I, I don't perceive that that's going to change. 
Yeah, and I was just going to add just one more point that I think what's really important um, and for, for others to understand, we're actually technology companies and we're energy technology companies. And so that is um, that technology has always been very prevalent in our industry. But I don't think it was like a best hidden secret secret. And until shale revolution happened, everyone started talking about technology. But we are innovating from the technology perspective all the time. So I think that that hopefully that's an attraction if someone wants to come and innovate and if someone wants to come and actually impact the energy transition. That is that is your way in. That's what you can do. And George, maybe I'll just say, uh, you know, to, to earn a living in the sector, look, you get to take heavy capital, you get to take almost pure at times microeconomics, and you get to take public policy and put it into a pot and stir it around. And, you know, learning to navigate that is uh, can be a lot of fun, for sure. Thank you all. Let, let me direct the next question, um, uh, an audience question. Let me um, put this, Bob, to, to you, because I think it relates largely to some of your comments on peak demand. And, and that is, you know, it seems like we've talked about various policy or political forces driving so much, but uh, one of the audience members points out that there's plenty of evidence uh, to suggest that, um, uh, that really market forces are more of a driver than political forces, regardless of, of how much um, some policymakers can can try. In other words, if you look at um, the vast expansion um, in oil and gas production under during the Obama administration, and um, even in the last few years, you've seen uh, you've seen a decline in, uh, in in coal in coal production. A lot of coal going offline. It, doesn't that suggest that really market forces win in the end, and, and the political um, the political issues or forces or policies that you've discussed um, may, be, may be secondary. Any comments on that, Bob? Yeah, no, I do, have, I do have thoughts on that. I think it's important to differentiate between power and transportation, the two main applications of modern energy systems. In power, indeed, we have seen dramatic falls in coal use. Was that policy-driven or market-driven? Uh, I would argue it is mainly market driven. Uh, it was a, really a consequence of the shale gas revolution, which preceded the shale oil revolution. We just made uh, coal fired plants that are just, you know, uneconomic. Regulation, the direction of travel, et cetera, and so forth helped, but that was largely a market generated uh, uh, dynamic. And the gas, in addition to putting coal down on the ropes, backstop renewables and help make renewables more deployable uh, due to the intermittency, intermittency problem. Uh, how ironic, now Now we're into a phase, and you see this in California, where they want to kill the gas plants. So we're into a new phase, which is kind of saying, can renewables uh, alone sort of uh, carry the, 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 the bulk of the, of the demand growth going forward? I think that is a question where physics and economics and logistics and things may collide a little bit with political will. But I would say in the power side, there has been a market-driven dynamic, primarily the unlocking of shale gas reserves, which has made the demise of coal and, uh, and renewables uh, more powerful. And policy is just sort of a secondary factor. On transportation, the idea that we're going to get into electric vehicles, in my view, is almost entirely policy-driven. Uh, what do policymakers have? They have three tools in a tool test, tax, spend and regulate. That's all any government on the planet can do. With the power of the state, you go to jail if you don't you obey the law, but it's basically tax, spend, and regulate. And what we see in countries where there's EV adoption is uh, subsidies work. Uh, we do see strong growth in EV sales when the cost is subsidized. Uh, when, however, we've also have plenty of evidence when you withdraw those subsidies, uh, that sales collapse. You've seen that in China since last year. You've seen that in various U.S. states, which withdrew subsidies, uh, and you've seen that in other places. And indeed, I think there's a recognition now that even in countries that are maintaining the subsidies, it's not leading to fast enough commercial uptake of electric vehicles. Consumers aren't flocking to them. So they are augmenting what subsidies remain with bans, really, sort of uh, 
just uh, prohibitions on the purchase of, of internal combustion engine cars. I think it's going to be a fascinating political science experiment to see whether democracies can force their publics uh, to stop buying uh, affordable means of transportation if there's no alternative that the consumer wants to buy. That's going to be, I think, a first time in history, and I, I think it's going to be fascinating. I mean, some countries are very good at restricting consumer choice, but I think North Korea, Belarus, you know, Cuba are not where people are thinking of going. You know, I want to step back and say, look at the, if you think about uh, uh, transportation, I think the idea of peak demand in oil is sort of like that policymakers are going to trigger the last big change in prime movers in personal transportation, from horses, where human beings were using that for about five million years, uh, to, to cars. And, and that happened very fast, really, about 120 years ago. Uh, you have that famous picture of Manhattan in 1905 when there's a million horses and buggies in one car, and then a picture the same place in 1915 or whatever where there's a one horse and buggy and a million cars, and people say, look, we got off of horses, we got into cars, why can't we get out of gasoline and into batteries really fast? Big difference was that was not a policy-driven change. We, to, and Mark speaks so eloquently and passionately about it, and he's right, we, we were able to unlock creativity, ingenuity, and invention. We created a better way of producing energy and new machines to use the energy, and we developed the, the car, uh, the internal combustion engine car. We've had battery cars since the very beginning. Matter of fact, the first vehicles, uh, battery cars, preceded oil cars. And uh, in the early automotive race, uh, alcohol, biofuels, renewable fuels, uh, batteries and oil were all competing with each other. We had plenty of each. Oil went out for its own its own reasons, and we ended up putting the, you know, a lot of the gas and 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 into uh, into electricity and so forth. But um, uh, so we've had battery cars for a long time, but we haven't reached the point. And I think if you look at almost any study, uh, whether they're enthusiastic or skeptical about the energy transition, all of them will say, especially the environmental community, we need stronger policies. We need stronger policies to make sure that consumers flock to those electric cars and that that electricity is clean. It's on a, on, the market is not doing it alone. So with, with the oil demand, I say, it hinges almost entirely on whether policymakers are able and willing to tax, spend, and regulate in a wartime sort of environment with a wartime framing to rush a transition that is otherwise, in my view, not occurring, according to the best evidence, due to market forces alone. So, Bob, uh, you know, just to maybe push back a, a little bit on you, um, uh, you know, yes, it is government interaction, but you know, the, the debate out there is about an externality, which people uh, and science says is actually changing the planet and will impact, you know, billions of people and change the way the world works. Um, you know, the Clean Air Act uh, was put in place by a Republican administration. They, they used, effectively used market-based uh, plans. It was policy for sure. But, you know, SO2, NOx, and mercury um, also, by the way, drove billions of dollars of investment in coal plants. And ultimately, these same environmental rules, along with shale gas, well as a shale gas alone, helped take out uh, and continuing to help take out the coal coal fleet. So, you know, uh, again, and, and I know, you know, obviously central planning isn't get us a long way, but the idea of a shared goal to lower CO2 emissions caused by humans, put a market price on it and allow competition to occur, um, you know, while that is government intervention at some level, not all the market has worked in the past um, in the energy sector. And so I'm just kind of curious, um, you know, how, how you kind of mix that with uh, your prior statements. Yeah, no, it's a very good point, Thad. I think your describing and framing of the issue is absolutely right, but only up until about 2016 is it relevant. I, I think we've moved well beyond 2016. Uh, if you look at the Democratic Party platform, uh, the policies by Kamala Harris and Joe Biden, and what Europe and even California are talking about. So as I said in my opening remarks, you're absolutely right. We have had enormous successes, largely under Republican administrations, I might add, uh, in environmental protection, uh, getting rid of uh, pollutants in fuels and air pollutants, ambient air pollutants, like you mentioned, 
because we had political will to do it, we had the technology to do it. There were cost-effective solutions to go take lead out of gasoline, clean up socks and ox. You're, you're absolutely right. Climate change is a completely different animal. Uh, we do not yet have cost-effective solutions to rapidly decarbonize, certainly transportation, less so perhaps with, with power. And until 2016, you know, in 20, 2008 race, McCain, Obama, and so forth, it absolutely, it was a, look, market-based solutions based on the Clean Air Act, pragmatic, uh, let's do this, you know, carefully, but let's do it deliberately. Uh, we got sulfur, the Bush administration got sulfur out of, out of, we went to low sulfur diesel. I mean, we've had successes and we can do it. That's not what we're talking about now. Banning car sales, ICE car sales in 2030, uh, committing to net zero carbon in 2035, uh, I think those would entail transformations that would be beyond anything we've seen in the past in terms of scale and cost, as I'm aware of, so even in power, certainly in oil. And uh, again, if you look at the Green New Deal, and uh, it's not really a specific document, but I think it's very important to read because it, it, it frames how the Democratic Party increasingly, especially the young folks, are thinking about environmental protection. There was very little support for a carbon fee. I think right now, if industry could agree on a $50 a ton, $100 a ton carbon tax and get rid of some command and control, we'd do, we'd do that deal in a minute. But that deal is over. That, that, that is off the table. Bernie Sanders isn't talking about a carbon fee. Most Democrats who remember getting BTU'd in the 1990s, they're not talking about a carbon fee. They realize when you talk about a carbon fee, you're talking about a tax, and a tax is a great way to lose power, uh, lose office, and so forth. So they've moved on, and the Green New Deal talks about wartime mobilization. World War II is their model. And this is about addressing a planetary emergency in 10 or 15 years, requiring a complete upending in our energy systems, using all the powers of the state, making it the central, central foreign policy, economic justice, income, racial justice, and so forth. So I think we are on a different planet in terms of how we're thinking about and discussing climate change now relative to those other areas of environmental regulation where there was more of a consensus, more pragmatism, and more success. Yeah, I'm not sure yet we know where this is, how this is going to play out um, and, and can attempt to be nonpartisan about this um, for a minute. Uh, it is very clear that, um, you know, the act the policy, and I agree with you, got way in front of the academic work. I said that up front, and the physics and the economics have not clearly been understood. It is becoming understood now. As it's becoming understood, I think you will actually see policies moderate, moderate or shift in response to uh, people beginning to understand the physics and the economics. And I, for one, I, and I know it's not the platform of, um, of Vice President Biden, um, uh, it's also not the platform of President Trump either. <laughs> you know, we are very supportive of a price on carbon, but there are center-right groups like the one founded by Secretary Baker, as well as center-left groups with some NGOs and a bunch of companies that are advocating for this economy like cost and carbon. And that policy may not work in the House right now, but maybe it could work in the Senate. So, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I get there's some proposals out there that don't necessarily hold together, but I also think that there's room in the academic work, uh, you know, that there's going to be, let me put it this way, climate change is based on science and analytics. I actually think we need to take that same discipline of analytics and apply it to how we actually reach the solution. And I guess maybe I'm a little more optimistic than you that ultimately we'll get to our rational policy. You know, as I, as I often say when I, when I brief clients and so forth, I, I hope you're right and I hope I'm wrong, uh, but I am a little more pessimistic uh, about uh, having been in Washington for 30 years, worked in administration. When I see policymakers uh, interact with physics and science, uh, it's not a pretty outcome. And so uh, I think that clash is, is coming. The, the only thing I, I'll, I add to this conversation, I think I mentioned it earlier um, in some of my remarks, that traditionally we worked as an industry a very kind of insulated way in solving problems. Uh, with this pressure on climate change and the energy transition, there are so many other groups, so many other industries, so many other companies involved. So I do believe that uh, in partnerships with uh, different organizations, I did mention, you know, Amazons and Googles, and uh, everyone has made a commitment, right? So they've made a commitment. They don't really know exactly how they're going to get there because, you know, that's where the science comes in and the physics and, and things like that. And that's where we come in because we really understand it really well. 
So when we combine the, the I think, the financial power of what this other organization can, can uh, bring in, when we combine the startup's mindset and thinking outside the box and not um, declaring something is not doable, but thinking, you know, well, why not? Why can't we take a look at this? And, and then our, um, you know, years and years and years of experience of what energy is all about, I think that combination is going to, to, to drive a, a solution, and perhaps sooner rather than later, because as, a, as, and again, maybe I'm too optimistic and I'm always glass half full, uh, but I do believe the desire across the, you know, the whole humanity is not just, you know, protect the climate, but also give the, the um, you know, give them the life that everyone wants and deserves, not just in the, in the countries like ours, but other countries. So I think we can probably, um, that's the big change that I'm seeing is it's partnership uh, across, you know, the, we don't have any borders when it comes to that now. And then there is the government and the regulation. So that's a separate conversation. <laughs> Thank you, panelists. Thank you. This excellent uh, discussion. We have about five minutes left. Let me um, uh, ask one last question, and if, if we may have time for more, but let me put one more question out there. Uh, for I'll start with Mark, but anyone who would like to comment on it. Mark, you made some comments in general about energy security, and, and what does energy security look like um, during an energy transition or even somewhere down the road? Um, uh, I'd like to get, the, the, and there have been several co questions coming in uh, having to do with, you know, the United States uh, leadership role uh, on the global stage. Uh, obviously, uh, folks who tuned in to Secretary Baker a little while earlier this morning. Um, I'd love to get your comments, Mark, uh, on what, what does an energy security really look like in um, outside of sort of where we are now in the future? And, and what are the what are the risks and vulnerabilities? What does it look like uh, if if we move to a less secure future than than what we've had in place in the oil and gas industry globally for some time? Wow. Well, I mean, traditionally we're used to thinking about energy security in terms of you know the disruptions that happen somewhere else. Um, that still matters. I mean, just last year, there was an attack on the main Saudi oil processing facility at Abqaiq that resulted in the biggest oil supply disruption the world has ever seen for a day. Uh, and thanks to you know, a combination of the technical wizardry of the, the staff, uh, the Saudi Aramco staff there, and some good luck, um, you know, Saudi Arabia was able to actually restore production pretty quickly. But I'll tell you, you know, losing 6 million barrels a day uh, out of the market overnight would have been a, a significant uh, impact on on global oil prices and on um, and on people's pocketbooks. Now, here in the United States, of course, the calculus has shifted as the United States has moved from being a massive importer to being, um, you know, at least you know on recent data, a net exporter uh, of oil and and a, and a net exporter of oil, natural gas, and coal. Um, but um, you know, as we move, yeah, I think so. That's one thing that's shifting is the the nexus of what it means. I mean, for all of our historical focus on energy security of supply, the energy producers around the world have always, you know, equally complained, "Hey, why don't you focus on security of demand for us?" Um, and uh, I think it's noteworthy in that regard that in the face of the biggest collapse of oil demand the world has ever seen this spring, you know, with the outbreak of the COVID pandemic and related policy measures, well, how did the United States intervene? The United States intervened on the side of cutting production. You know, it was President Trump who got the Saudis and the Russians back together again to orchestrate the biggest coordinated production cuts in history. Uh, so I think that's one dimension of shifting. But I think more broadly, if we think about breaking down energy security into you know, vulnerability and risk, then what you, know, you can use that framework to think about the transition and what's shifting around us. So you know, as the role of oil or, and fossil fuels falls off in, an, in a successful transition scenario, we will become more dependent on other forms of energy. So for example, people say, well, wind and solar is great because it's domestically produced. Fabulous. Where are the solar panels made? Where are the wind turbines made? Where are the control systems written? That govern these systems and their operations. Um, you know, so I think that it's important to think about you know the how our economy and the vulnerability of our economy to shifting uh, you know uh, energy patterns um, will matter um, because 
in any scenario, energy is going to remain a fundamentally important input to our economy. Uh, and that's what we need to understand so that we can, um, you know, develop policies to manage and mitigate. Thank you, Mark. And, and with that, I believe we are right at our time. This has been an outstanding panel. I want to thank all four of you for joining us um, today. Really appreciate your comments. I also want to thank the audience for the outstanding questions that you sent in uh, during the panel today. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, but hopefully we touched on, on enough to, um, uh, to, to satisfy folks. I think we could keep going for another 30 minutes or an hour if, with, with this group if, uh, if we could. But, uh, but with that, thank you again very much. Appreciate your attending and please uh, come back for the final day of our conference uh, this Friday. Thank you very much.